Hey everyone, welcome back to Signal Processing with Paul. And in this video, what I wanna do is show you how we can plot the Fourier transform of signals here in MATLAB. This will be a really basic video, but it's really important, especially if you're you know, an intro to ECE type student and you're using MATLAB to plot things. So we wanna go through the technicalities of the Fourier transform and plotting it, because it can be a little challenging using DFT, getting the intuition here. So let's go ahead and get started. First thing I want to do is define number of samples, and I'm just gonna set this to be 100 for now. And I need an X of T, a signal that I'm gonna plot, and I'm gonna say X of T equals zeros of num samples. So we're gonna have 100 equally spaced, or just 100 points really, and they're all gonna be zero. Now, the reason I'm using a semicolon is if you don't, it'll print this stuff. So using a semicolon will just not cause it to print. So I tend to use the semicolons all the time. And from here, we can go ahead and plot our signal. We'll just plot X of T. Now my X label here is going to be simply my sample index. Now usually you would plot an X versus a Y, but when you don't pass in an X, it assumes that the samples are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, et cetera, all the way up to the number of samples, which is what we have. So I'll show you what how you can do this instead, but we'll do that in a second. And my Y label is X of T, and my title is simply plot of X of T. So we go ahead and run this, and sure enough, what do we see? Just a flat signal. This is the same, the sample index, as if I had just plotted one to 100 like this. So that's what we have. The other thing I wanna say is this zeros function by default will create a matrix. So what's probably better is if we pass in a one. So rather than creating 100 by 100, we're creating just simply 100 points. So that's one thing to know about the zeros function. And plotting all this, this is what we see. To make this a little bit more interesting, what I'm gonna do is set the first 10 points of X of T to be one. So now what we're going to have is a box function. So it's gonna be one from zero to 10 and then zero otherwise. That's what we see. Now let's go ahead and look at the Fourier transform of this. So what I'm gonna do is say, XF equals FFT of X of T. This will create the Fourier transform. And let's go ahead and quickly plot this. So I'm gonna add a new figure. We do that this way. You may not need to do this, but I like making a new figure whenever I wanna do something. And what I'm gonna do is just say, plot X of F. The X label is going to now be the frequency index because we're plotting the Fourier transform. The Y label is the FFT of X of T, and the title is also the FFT of X of T. So we run this and we see this. Now this is weird. This is not what we expect. I, this is not what we want to see. What's going on here? Well, remember that the Fourier transform is going to return real and imaginary components. Now, some people get confused here because they say, wait a minute, I have a completely real signal. Why am I getting something imaginary? Well, the reason for this is because just because your signal's real doesn't mean the Fourier transform is gonna be real. Remember that due to Euler's expression, e to the j theta equals cosine of theta plus j sine of theta. So all of my even terms become real and all of my odd terms become completely imaginary. So in order to plot this more accurately, we should plot the real and imaginary parts separately. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create a subplot. Now this, what this will allow me to do is have multiple plots in the same figure. We're gonna do a two by one subplot. So it's gonna be basically two rows, one column. And what I'm going to do here is this will be the first one where we plot the real part of this. So all we do is say real of X of F, and this is real part of F of T. And similarly to here, here this is the real part of X of T. And similarly, we can do the same for the imaginary part. So now we're going to index in to the second row of this subplot. So basically you say number of rows, number of columns, and the index you're indexing in. Here I'm doing the same thing, but this is for the imaginary part, second index. So instead of real, we're going to use the imaginary operator. This is very similar to what we talked about in our imaginary videos. And we have here the imaginary part of the Fourier transform and the imaginary part of the Fourier transform. So now when we run this, we see something a little bit more not so surprising. We have, of course, this 
function here, which goes from zero and we get our sync function, which is of course even. And we have our imaginary part, which is of course odd. These are all the sign terms. This is what we expect. Now, one thing to realize is the way this thing is calculated is this isn't, you know, when we have our box function, what we get is a sync function, sine of x over x, but that's not what we're seeing here. The reason for this is what's being plotted here is zero frequency all the way up to positive frequency. And then once you reach your maximum positive frequency, you then start looking at your negative frequency. So you go from your maximum positive frequency to your minimum negative frequency. So we go up to positive frequency 50, basically. And then we go to negative frequency, negative 50, and you have a jump. And that kind of has to do with aliasing. Now this is confusing. So what often we like to do is we like to do FFT shift. What FFT shift will do is take this half and move it over here. So you start with your negative frequency, go up to your zero frequency, and then do all your positive frequencies. So all you need to do is just say FFT shift. Um, you could do it before or after the real operator, it doesn't matter, but that's what I'm going to do is just add in FFT shift. And now that we do this, we see our familiar sync function here in the real part and our imaginary part, we see the odd pieces. This is plotting it in polar form, but we can also plot this in cart or er, in, sorry, this is plotting it in Cartesian form. We can, or rectangular form. We can also plot this in polar form as well. The way to do that is rather than using real and imaginary, we're going to use abs, which will be the magnitude in polar form. And here, rather than imaginary, we are going to use angle. So this is not the real part. This is the magnitude of the Fourier transform, and this is also the magnitude of the Fourier transform of x of t, and this is going to be the angle. So let's just do this, and the angle of f of t, like so. So we're plotting now the magnitude and angle rather than real and imaginary. So when we run this, and we don't need to do this again, but I will just run it, and sure enough, this is what we see. We see our sync function. However, it is the square root of the sync function squared, which is the real and imaginary part squared. Hence, this lobe is bigger. And what's going on here? Why, why do we see these angles? Well, remember that e to the j pi is minus one. So what we're seeing here is when it jumps like this, that's when it crosses from positive to negative. Now, now here's zero. It's actually going below zero for the real part. It can be hard to see, but um, it is going negative. You can see if I, you know, basically drag this number around, you can see it is going negative, which is what we see. Maybe it's more clear to see here. So whenever it changes direction from positive to negative in the magnitude, we get a jump of pi to say that we're now going in the negative direction. So that's what is going on here, which is kind of interesting to see. So one thing I want to do to really drive this point home of what we're seeing is rather than plotting X of T like this, I want to plot X of T that is symmetric. Now, this gets to be a little technical when it comes to these digital signals. So what I'm going to do is plot X of T from two to five. So two, three, four, and five is going to be one and X of T from basically 96 to the end. You can just use the end here to be one. So when I plot this, what's going on here, and let me add semicolons um, with my X of T now. And what I should do here is add a figure. So we have our, you know, we're not getting confused with what we had before. We now have positive and positive. Now, the reason I'm doing this is now our signal is completely symmetric in the sense that it is now even symmetric. And as we should expect, we should see a completely real Fourier transform and no imaginary part. And actually to do this, we need to start from 97 because it's 97, 98, 99, 100. 2 to 5 is 4 points, and 97 to 100 is 4 points. So, sure enough, or actually, let me do this again. And sure enough, when I run this, what do we see? Our Fourier transform is completely real, and our imaginary part, this is basically machine precision, 5 times 10 to the minus 16th. It's just a bunch of noise. So this is basically 0, as we expect to see. And our magnitude and angle, this is no surprise. This is kind of what we see as well, although we do have our same jumps that we see kind of before when we are switching directions. And a jump of two pi is nothing. It's just 
multiplying by one. So that doesn't really do anything, but that just has to do with this noise that we see here. Similarly, if our signal is completely odd symmetric, not even symmetric, which would mean this would be minus one, what we should expect to see is the real part being zero and the imaginary part having some positive component. And sure enough, when we do this, doesn't matter which one you make negative, as long as x of t is equal to minus x of minus t, we see the imaginary part here, we get our odd symmetry because our signal is completely real, and our real part of the Fourier transform is basically zero, and likewise our magnitude, this is pretty much what we see. Once again, we have these symmetries in the real and imaginary part simply because our signal is completely real. If it wasn't real, for instance, if this was one eye, we would no longer see, this is weird, but we would no longer see the type of conjugate symmetry that we would expect to see from a completely real signal. But once again, that's very rare. Usually we just have a real, completely real signal like this. And this is what we end up seeing. So let me just run all of these again. And this is what we get. So hopefully you found this helpful and I'll provide this, this MATLAB interactive script, this live script, so you can check it out and play with it on your own. Thanks for watching.